The U.S. empire holds countless political prisoners in its vast prison network. From black power to national liberation movements, people deemed threats to the system languish for decades behind bars. Among those are five Palestinian men, known as the Holy Land Five, victims of George Bush's massive repression operation against Muslims living in the U.S. These men, Shukri Abu Baker, Ghassan Alashi, Mufid Abdul Qadar, Abdul Raham Odeh, and Mohammed El Mazain, and their organization, the Holy Land Foundation, were simply a charity for Palestinian refugees. Charged with aiding terrorism, their sentences range from 15 to 65 years. To understand more about this little known case and the alarming precedent it sets for all international solidarity activists in the US, I sat down with Miko Piled, author of Injustice, the story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. I just got through your book, Injustice. Uh, wow, what an incredible book. Um, everyone needs to buy it, they need to read it, they need to learn about this insane case. The Holy Land Foundation became the largest Muslim charity in the US. Um, millions of dollars in distribution of aid. Talk about how it started and also what programs it fostered. So this is an interesting question. In the trial, the Holy Land Foundation trial, they wanted to, they had to show that Holy Land was connected to Hamas. And they said Holy Land was established in 1987, Hamas was established in 1997, therefore the two are connected. <laughs> what they left out are two other aspects, two other things that happened in 1987. Shukri, who was the CEO, his daughter was born, Sanabil was born in 1987, and I dedicate the book to her. And um, she was born ill, and she needed a lot of care. And this exposed Shukri to the world of chari chari charitable giving and relief and so forth. And he decided he would like to work and provide that same kind of care, the same kind of relief to children in Palestine. So that was the inspiration. She inspired him to, to do this. Um, so 1997, the Intifada starts. So there's a great need for relief in Palestine. Massive uh, arrests. You know, so a lot of families don't have a breadwinner. Curfews, so people can't go to work, can't buy food and a lot of casualties, which means a lot of orphans. And so that created a need for relief. Um, so that's how Holy Land began. And then it was Shukri, Hassan, and uh, Hassan Ilashi, and Muhammad al mazain who was kind of the inspiration, the, the spiritual guide, if you will. Um, and they, uh, they started to work, and they did, a re they did a really fine job. They worked smart. They worked based on uh, Islamic rules, which means um, over 90 cents per dollar actually went to relief, which is really unheard of. Um, and they were trustworthy, and they showed up. You know, after Oklahoma City bombing, they showed up. After 9-11, they showed up. Tornadoes and floods all over the country, they were there. Um, all over the world, uh, Turkey, Chechnya, Albania, places where there was a need, where there were refugees, or where there was relief because of uh, natural disasters, they were there to help out. And they began building uh, coalitions and, and alliances with other relief organizations internationally and they were winning, winning awards and and as they were doing all of this what they really didn't realize that they're doing is painting a whole new picture uh, of Palestine a very positive picture of Palestinians doing good work and a need in Palestine that isn't being met by the controlling power in Palestine which is Israel um, and this was really the, the reason for their downfall um, now, in, 19, in the mid-90s, 95, 96, under Bill Clinton, Hamas was designated a terrorist organization. Um, and the premise was that they were opposed to the peace process. So any organization, any group that opposed or seemed to pro um, pose a threat to the Middle East peace process, which of course was going nowhere and uh, seemed hopeless, to help, you know, hopeless for most people, to most people, uh, was was placed on a list as a designated terrorist organization. So from that moment on, it became illegal to do business with Hamas, to provide funds to Hamas, or to any organization that's connected to Hamas. And so when that happened, uh, um, the, the leaders of many Muslim and Arab organizations came to Washington, D.C. to talk to the Treasury Department and to talk to the State Department to find out who they can work with, to get some clarifications. And it was, it was made clear very early on that the U.S. government does not want to provide them with help, does not want to provide them with guidance. 
And in fact, they had multiple meetings with Treasury officials, State Department officials. Well, what did they say when they were pleading for help? Yeah. So in the early 90s, when it was clear that they were that they were changing the story about Palestine, even though that was not necessarily their intention, then the uh, Anti-Defamation League, the ADL, um, which pretends to be a civil rights organization, but is really a fascist organization with, that supports terrorism and, and, and racism, they began to uh, chip away at the reputation of the Holy Land Foundation. They went to the IRS asking for them to revoke their uh, not-for-profit status. They started publishing all these papers, uh, conspiracy uh, papers about uh, Islam and jihad terrorism in America, and Holy Land was mentioned in it. And they made alliances with people like Chuck Schumer, Anthony Weiner, Elliot Spitzer, who were all created this, this, this coalition to fight and bring down Holy Land. They started publishing articles in Dallas um, uh, saying that they're somehow connected to terrorism, that they're connected to Hamas. This is even before Hamas was designated a terrorist organization. So there was this clear attempt to bring them down because you can't have anything that's Palestinian that's portrayed in a positive light. Anything that's Palestinian has to be connected to terrorism. Otherwise, people are going to change their mind and change the story about Palestine. So that was that was the background. And what they did was, when these articles began coming out, they they themselves initiated contacts with the FBI, both in Dallas. Then they initiated contacts in in Washington D.C. with federal officials to see what they were doing wrong and who's spreading these rumors. And it was John Bryant, former congressman, who was who was also their attorney. Um, and he went to the Israeli embassy. They told him. They'll call him back. They didn't, so he called back, and eventually they said, "Well, our government told us not to talk to you." So I mean, they were led into this very clearly without any guidance, right. and nobody wanted to help them. So it's almost like there was a trap there, and they were being entrapped, and they were doing everything right, and they believed that because they're doing everything right, they're going to be safe because this is, after all, America. And the trap was closed right after 9/11, when Bush designated the Holy Land Foundation a terrorist organization, um, saying the money is going to quote indoctrinate children to grow up into suicide bombers and to recruit suicide bombers and support their families. What evidence did the government have to corroborate this statement, Miko? Absolutely none. Absolutely none. Which is exactly what the problem was. Bush didn't know what he was talking about, but uh, the the. Uh, People around him were told that on a certain day he's going to make an announcement and they got to have something for him. Uh, and this was documented in lots of, lots of places, books and so forth. And so they were scrambling uh, what to do, you know. So they decided, well, let's just round up the usual suspects. And Hoyland was, you know, really the top of the usual suspect list. And then the president said that they, he designated them <clears throat> without due process, but with an executive order as a terrorist organization and closed them down. Well, now everybody had to work backwards and put together proof that didn't exist. So they decided to sue the government to get rid of the designation and to uh, unfreeze their assets. This was after Ramadan. They had a lot of money in the bank. And they really were not worried because they did everything right. And all the evidence was on their side. And every penny was accounted for. You could trace every penny, where it came from, where it went. Their taxes were filed on time. They had, they had lawyers. I mean, they had everything done right. So they weren't concerned. They sued the government, and the lawyers weren't concerned either. And uh, they prepared, you know, a very serious case, showing everything they had, proving clearly that no money went to Hamas, they had no connection to Hamas. The government had the administrative record, which is what the government, the proof the government uh, presents to explain why they did what they did. Um, there were no uh, statements under oath. Nothing was notarized. They had a bunch of translations that were wrong photocopies of documents that were faxed over uh, and were seized by the Israeli government, and a couple of newspaper articles uh, that were saying that they're connected to Hamas. So basically, there was nothing there that should have even been allowed to enter a court of law. The judge in D.C., her name is Gladys Kessler, dismissed the case and struck all the evidence, their evidence. Now, this was unbelievable. I mean, the, the lawyers could not believe this. What was particularly problematic about that was that in the government's, um, in the government's administrative record, there was a, a statement supposedly made by their office manager in Jerusalem. His name is Muhammad Anati. And uh, I talk about him a lot in the book. It was a very interesting story that I had meeting him. And apparently, according to the government's document, he said at one point to the Israeli authorities that um, they actually did give some money to Hamas. Now, the lawyers checked that out. They spoke to his attorney, 
in Jerusalem. Leah Tzemel was a well-known human rights attorney, and she said, he said no such thing. I have all of his statements. So she sent over the statements. They had them translated, notarized, under oath, and he said the exact opposites. He said, we have not given any money to any political or uh, military organizations. We never did. We never do. That's not what we do. That bit of the evidence was struck out, was struck by the judge. The wrong translation in the administrative record was accepted. So that's the, oh, that's the only evidence that existed in the record was the wrong evidence, what the government had, um, had presented. In the appeal, because they had appealed, of course, the appellate court said, well, perhaps you should not have struck the evidence. However, <clears throat> and at this moment is when the lawyers realize what they're facing, that all the normal regulations and laws and rules that are supposed to protect citizens have been thrown out. The appellate court said, however, and this is not a regular case. This is a case of national security, and therefore, they upheld the lower court's decision. And uh, the lawyers just couldn't, did not realize, and these are serious, you know, veteran lawyers. These are people who have been around for a long time doing this work. They realized at that moment that after 9-11, their clients were not going to get a fair trial. And then they realized, they heard, that the government was preparing to indict them that there were criminal charges being brought against them. And again, the lawyers thought, again, what? They did nothing wrong. There's no proof that they did anything wrong. And that's when the government changed the story again. But all of this was done in an effort to prove George Bush right, because he made the state, the president made the statement, and there was no proof, so now they had to scramble and figure out a way to make what he said true. So one story didn't work. They realized that, you know, there was too much evidence showing that they did not give money to Hamas. So they changed the story, and that's the story they presented, the new story that they presented in the criminal case. The new story was that they did not give money to Hamas. They did not give money directly to terrorist organizations. But by providing charity to Palestinians, they alleviated the need of Hamas to provide relief. And therefore, they could use all the resources to make bombs and, to, and, and, you know, and engage in terrorism. Now, Holy Land was working, just like many other relief organizations around the world, were working with Zakat committees, which are local charity organizations in Palestine. They have them in every city, in every town. These are the local charity organizations, and they know the lay of the land, and everybody works with them. They were vetted by the CIA. The State Department, USAID worked with them. Other national relief organizations worked with these Zakat committees. The prosecution said these committees are controlled by Hamas. And to that end, they brought in documents more documents that were seized, again, by the Israeli army, illegally, of course, uh, were kept God knows where in some storage area and then faxed over and translated poorly, obviously, um, and brought into the courtroom. Now, when you look at these documents, there's no beginning, there's no end, there's no date, there's no signature, nothing's notarized, but it's from the government of Israel, and that was enough. Oh, so we can trust that. So we can trust that. <laughs> because they're our friends, and they also know terrorism. <laughs> then they brought, or not then, at the same time, they brought two experts, anonymous experts, who are Israeli nationals, that testified anonymously. One was an officer in the Israeli military uh, intelligence, so they claim, and one is uh, an officer in the, um, the Shabak, the Israeli secret police, so they claim. Nobody knows their names, nobody knows their credentials, and they are brought in as experts to say, they know Hamas, and the Zakat communities are Hamas, and what Israel says is true. So that was worrisome because, first of all, this was unprecedented. In the history of the United States, that, this sort of thing has never been allowed, to bring anonymous expert witnesses or foreign nationals to testify in a case like this, number one. Number two, it was, it was, it was, it was unconstitutional. But even with all of that, the lawyers made it absolutely clear that these guys did not know what they were talking about. They presented them with each and every uh, Zakat committee that was listed in the indictment. Each and every member of the board of every Zakat committee, of every city that was listed in the indictment. There was no proof, there was no reason to believe that any of them had anything to do with Hamas. Their best proof was that in some of their offices they found keychains with pictures of, uh, of martyrs. I mean, that was, the, that was the weight of the evidence. And you have to read it to believe it. You have to read the court transcripts and I put quite a few in the book, I would have put them, all 20,000 of them in there if I could, uh, to believe what went on in that courtroom. It was absolutely a joke. Then, at the end of the trial, the trial ended with no convictions. It was a hung jury. No convictions. 
Um, and that was it. So they declared a mistrial. About a year later, they came back and, and, and again, they changed the story. They changed the indictments. There were different charges for each one of the five. Um, and they ended up with all um, convictions. And it really comes down to those two secret witnesses because even the judge said that really did influence him for the conviction. Yes, and even though in cross-examination, the, the defense team did a great job showing that these guys don't know what they're talking about. The best, the best claim that they had was that they know Hamas so well that they can smell Hamas involvement. You know, the, you know the, that's the kind of arrogance and patronizing uh, atmosphere that existed in that court of law. All these terrorism experts, complete nonsense. They don't know the history, they don't know Hamas, they don't know Palestine, but they know terrorism and that's how it was decided that these zakat committees were actually um, you know, governed or controlled by Hamas, even though they were not. And, and why doesn't that same logic apply to the UN, to NGOs, to USAID? They're all going through these Sakat committees, yeah. like you said, that were vetted by the CIA. Yeah. And even the, the American consul general in Jerusalem, former consul general at Abington, who testified for the defense, for, for Holy Land, said that the, at no time did the United States designate the Sakat committees as terrorist organizations. Why are two of the members serving life sentences of 65 years each? Shukri Abu Bakr and Hassan Elashi had the most. They were really the they were could be, they were really the ones who worked as part. They really operated the uh, the, the, the foundation, the organization. Shukri was the only, was was paid, and Hassan was a volunteer. But still, they were the the the, the, the main operatives, and they got uh, they you know all uh, something like 32 or 28 uh, charges um, and. Um, that's you do the math and that's how they came up with you know 65 years 60 you know 65 years it's it's beyond belief i mean these guys are not just innocent they're not just good men these are the finest people you'll ever meet they're not just innocent they dedicated their lives to good to doing good to doing the right thing they they all suffered from the from the tra from the palestinian tragedy personally their families they all suffered they all became refugees they all were denied they saw it with their eyes they experienced it as kids they saw their families experience it as well. And they came to America and they decided to do good. And for that, they were punished. So they got 65 years each. Mufid Abdul Qadir, who's supposed to be free because he was found not guilty on all charges in the first trial, is serving 20 years. And the other two, Mohammed al Mizain and Abdul Rahman Ode, serve 15 years each. If this entire story wasn't tragic enough, now these members are being held in communication management units, uh, basically called Little Guantanamo Bays. Um, talk about what the conditions are and also just like family visits. I mean, what are these people going through just in these prisons? You know, the assumption is that you commit a crime, you go to jail, you're punished, and that should be the end of it. These guys did not commit a crime and they're being punished over and over and over and over and over. So at first they were all in, um, in Texas, in a prison for a year and a half. They were perfect inmates. You know, I mean, these are, these are smart, good people, right? One day they were called in and shipped out. No warning, no nothing. At the end of this, they realized that they were being shipped to these communication management units, which are also called terrorist uh, uh, prisons or Muslim prisons or Guantanamo North. And these are basically uh, prisons that where every bit of their communication is monitored. And they're mostly for Muslims. Yeah, imagine with an entire family flying out. To, I mean, it's an enormous expense. When you get there, you might not get in. And when you do get in, then it's non-contact visitation. So there's a plexiglass and they have to talk on the phone. Sometimes the phone doesn't work, so the, can the visit's canceled, even though they can pro hear each other, just, you know. So that was, so they were all in communication in, in these units for a while. And then after a couple of years, a few years, they were moved out into what's called the general population. And it's horrifying, I mean, it's horrifying. It is, and you've been in contact with all of them. You publish a lot of their letters in the book, Miko. I mean, is there anything that you want to share about their words, their optimism? Amazingly, yeah. they have a lot of optimism and a lot of really wise words to say despite their yeah. sentences. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, uh, they're, they're free. They're all free. They're completely free. You know, you sit there, you know, the, the process of getting into the visitation room is so depressing and horrifying and, and humiliating. And you know, I do, I love these guys, but they're not my family, they're not my dad, right? It's different. 
you see people, millions of people going in to visit their, their family members, their loved ones, their children, you know, it's just a horrible thing. And then you, by the time you get into the visitation room, you just want to cry. And then off they go, back to prison. And you're free to go out, but you, you're, you're depressed, you know, it's horrible. It's really uh, such a sad and depressing reality that it's hard to put in words. And somehow they maintain, and I talk to them a lot about this, you know, they, they say it has everything to do with their belief, with their religious belief, with their spiritual foundation, which is very, very strong. But, you know, they're just sitting there, you know, they've got their dignity, they've got their, you know, their spirituality. They know they did the right thing. They know that they're political prisoners. And that's how they live through it. It's really, uh, it's really, it's really quite incredible. I can't imagine just the symbolism that this case sends to the Palestinian population as a whole. I mean, one of the quotes from your book just stuck to me um, of, of one of the Holy Land members just when he was a kid growing up in Gaza and saying, you know, why won't the Arab world help liberate us? And his friend says, as long as America is helping Israel, we don't have a chance. And right. this case really just cements that kind of pessimism, I feel like. I mean, by criminalizing aid work. Well, that reality, which is that as long as America supports Israel, Palestine will never be free, is, is very, very true. And this is exactly why they had to be brought down. That's why you have organizations like the Anti-Defamation League. That's why you have these racist Zionists like uh, Chuck Schumer and others who are, who are determined to make sure that anything that's Palestinian is somehow connected to terrorism, anti-Semitism, so that they can never gain, uh, they, they never gain a foothold in America, which, but they do, you know. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wear this button in every interview and in every lecture I give, and I think that this is the key. You know, if we want to see Palestine free, if we want to see these men free, there's a connection. These men are just exactly like the thousands of political prisoners, men, women, and children in Palestine, in, in, Palestine, in Israeli jails. They're no different. Um, and it's all connected to Palestine, to the freedom of, freedom of, in, of Palestine. And it's all connected to U.S.-American relations. And it's all connected to the need to start promoting this idea that it's okay to boycott Israel. There have to be sanctions imposed on Israel. There has to be every effort made in order to end the siege on Gaza. It's all connected. And so Palestinians gave us this gift, which is the call for BDS boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the state of Israel. This is a call that came from Palestine, from Palestinians. The demands are clear, reasonable, remedial, and basically the demands are freedom, equality, and justice. There's nothing anti-Semitic, there's nothing violent, there's no demand to kick anybody out. You know, it's, this is something that anybody can participate in. Anybody who, you know, people of conscience, need to embrace and, 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 and get to work. Because until we until we can um, get Palestine free, until, we are, until there are sanctions imposed on Israel to a point where they're kicked out of the Olympics, they're kicked out of FIFA, they're kicked out of any, any, any international uh, forum, nothing's going to change. So this is really, I believe, the key to freeing these guys, and it's the key to freeing all of Palestine and the prisoners in Palestine, because again, it's all connected. So it could happen very soon if we all embrace this call and get to work, or it can happen, you know, never. It all depends on how engaged we decide to be.